previous uh, session we looked at uh, what is called as inter-symbol interference and uh, we understood that if the uh, on the receiver side the present symbol gets affected by the past and uh, all the possible other symbols it is called as inter-symbol interference okay so now uh, how to avoid that right so that's what we are going to look uh, today uh, first all right so this is called as Nyquist criterion for distortionless binary transmission. That means distortionless in the sense it's a uh, uh, without ISI. Okay, right. So the topic is it's Nyquist criterion for. Distortionless baseband binary transmission. So some of the textbooks will call this condition also by the name condition for zero ISI. All right, so first let me give the statement of this particular condition. Okay, so this is the statement. Pulse shaping function. So, what is a function? Previously, we denoted that by the P of T. So, this is the same P of T. Okay, pulse shaping function P of T with the Fourier transform, uh, say denoted by capital. P of F, right, which which satisfies a specific condition, right? That is the this is the condition summation n equal to minus infinity to plus infinity capital P of F minus n times rv so we'll talk about the term rv which is a new term for us that is equal to t right has the p of i think this is time domain sorry so i have to use a small letter let me use a small letter so has p of this is i times capital t v minus the k times capital t v should be equal to this is one right if the i is equal to k and this is zero if i is not equal to k so this is the complete statement right so in the sense if you are using this as the p of t right sorry not this this is the p of t right if you use a p of t whose fourier representation is p of f right and it satisfies this condition, then this is called this. This has to be satisfied by that P of T, such a way that there will be no intersymbol interference. If this condition is satisfied, no ISO. Okay, let's try to prove this. Important question. Uh, the proof has been asked many times. Okay, so. Let uh, the pulse shaping function. What is that? That is P of T, right? That function. Uh, let us try to sample that. Okay. So let the pulse shaping fu function P of T is sampled. 
So which is a standard function used for sampling? You might have already studied the sampling theorem, right? So in the sampling theorem, we use the right a series of delta functions varying from minus infinity to plus infinity is used for sampling. So that function which has right delta function repeatedly or shifted from minus infinity to plus infinity everywhere you at 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, dot, 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 up to minus infinity to plus infinity. Every point you have a delta function, it is called as a, right, uh, what, what's the name? Do you remember the name for that uh, sampling function? Yes, it is called as a Dirac delta function or Dirac coom. It looks like a coom for us. Okay, so okay, that's good. So P of T is sampled by using. So I'll write the same name that is Dirac. Dirac coom function, right? So what is the sampling period that should be equal to dB? Okay, Dirac coom is sampled with the Dirac coom with uh, period equals to capital T. All right, so this process itself is the sampling process. So how do you define mathematically? This implies, right? Uh, I can write mathematically, you can try to write this P of T is your function uh, the Dirac delta is denoted by, if you remember the notation used uh, in the sampling, it will be S delta of T. Delta of T is the single delta function. Series of delta is S delta. That's what is the standard notation. So let's write that. So mathematically, I can try to write this as P delta of T is equal to the pulse shaping function that is P of T. Multiply that with S delta of T. Okay, so this is a sampled answer that is p delta of t. So p of t is nothing but the original function. S delta of t is the Dirac coup. Okay, fine. Now, you see, we are simply multiplying p of t into S delta of t is p delta of t. Right. Now, let us try to take the Fourier transform. Okay, on both sides. Right? P delta of T becomes capital P delta of F. Okay? Let us assume that P of T has a Fourier representation, capital P of F. What I should write, right, after this, right? If you remember, uh, please tell me. I also assume that the S delta of T has a uh, Fourier representation, S delta of F. Okay? So, I'll definitely write S delta of F. What I am missing here? Something should come. Some operation. Do you remember? Anything? No. No problem. Uh, we have a property of... Uh, uh, Fourier transform that is called as a convolution property, right? I'll write a property here, right? If you write x of t convolution y of t, right? The Fourier representation will be x of f into y of f. At the same time, you see now I am taking a product in the time domain, right? See that look at the time domain equation, it is a product, right? So that means if you if you have x of t into y of t, right, on the other side, that is the frequency side will be the convolution, that is x of f convolution, this is y of f. So this property itself is called as the convolutional convolution property of the Fourier representation. So wherever you use Fourier, you have to apply this. That means I can see that here I have to put a convolution. Okay, this becomes convolution because on the left hand side it is nothing but the product, time domain product, frequency domain convolution. Okay, right. But we have an equation, we have an equation for this. I'll call this is equation one. But, right, uh, 
we'll try to write the equation for s delta of t now. Okay, so s delta of t, it's an equation for the Dirac comb, right? The Dirac comb is directly given by summation. Uh, say k is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. This is delta function, delta of, right? This is n minus k times t b. Okay, that's the equation on the right left hand side. But now you see, I need to substitute uh, s delta of f over here. Correct? s delta of f is the frequency domain representation. So you need to take the Fourier transform. Right? So Fourier representation of s delta of t will be s delta of f. Okay? So there is one very special, very, very special feature uh, in the whole world of signals. Right? No other signal will be, is as special as a, as a Dirac Coombe function. Okay, why I told? Because whatever you are going to write here is actually a fascinating answer. Okay, do you remember something from a signal sign system? What is the Fourier representation of a Dirac Coombe? Right, Dirac Coombe is this one, right? As you remember, this is a Dirac function going all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity. If I take its Fourier representation, what do you get on the frequency side is my question. If you remember, you can plot a graph. If you remember an equation, you can write it. You can tell me the equation. Or if you simply remember the name of the signal, that is also fine. For anything. Hmm. Yes, so if you have a, that's the speciality, that's the only signal, right, whose Fourier is also the same thing, correct, Dirac function, when you take a Fourier, you get a Dirac function itself on the frequency domain, perfect, right, so that means this is Fs into summation, n is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity, delta of F minus n times fs. You see delta summation, delta of f shifted. That is a Dirac function. Correct? So Dirac becomes Dirac from the right. All right. So let me call this is equation number two. Right? I'll also make another substitution uh, because the statement does not use the fs in the uh, statement. I, it, it, <coughs> sorry. It uses another function, uh, another variable called rb. Let me bring the rb now. Okay. Uh, that is, see, I can try to, but the sampling frequency fs is equal to 1 divided by bit duration. Okay, this is what we know. This is also denote, denoted by rb. Okay, so this is the equation number 3. So I'm substituting that back now. So two and three, I'll put it back in equation number one. Fs is a sampling frequency, right? One, one by Tb, all right? So you, you see, it, it's like this. You have Tb here on the frequency domain, it becomes Fs, that's all. Tb becomes, Tb is a time, right? So how do you get a frequency from that? If you want to get a frequency from time, you need to take inverse, 1 by tb. 1 by tb is what fs. That's all. Okay, that's how it, it's there. So there is actually, in signals and system, we have done a problem to prove this. Okay, but now it's, it's of no use for us because anyway, it's already done and we know that. Okay, fine. So let's most proceed further. So what I'm trying to do now is uh, equation 2 and equation number 3, I'm going to put in 1. Right, so one means what you are trying to do, just go back and check. It's P delta of F, right? I'm writing the equation of P delta of F. That means I'm writing P delta of F is equal to, I don't know what is a P function, so I have to write it as it is. This is P of F convolution, right? I'm I, Equation one said that I have to write a S delta of F, but I know the value now, correct? So I'll simply write that answer, that is Fs, right? into, okay, fs, uh, anyway, I told that I'm going to replace that. I'll not write fs, I'll write rb instead of that, okay, because that's what has been used in the uh, statement of the uh, Nyquist criteria. 
All right, that's the only reason I'm writing. Otherwise, you can keep fs no issues. Okay, so n becoming starting from minus infinity to plus infinity, it's delta function of frequency domain. So f is my variable minus n is the index of the summation times r. Okay. All right. Now we have another property, right? Again, I'm taking this property from the uh, Fourier representation. Okay. Uh, Fourier, uh, not Fourier, sorry, uh, signal sign systems. My mistake, I'll correct. So the property of delta function, all right, it is something like, uh, this is the property. Right. If I try to write uh, something like, say, x of t convolution delta of t minus t naught answer is always equal to the capital X of t minus t naught. Okay, this is a property I'm using. In the sense, if you convolve any function with the shifted delta function, right? The function itself gets shifted to the location of the delta function. That's all. Okay. So you see here, where is it located? Delta function is located at t minus t. Where is x is located? x is located at, at a particular t. But when you convolve, the result is nothing but the x getting shifted to this location. Right. That's why it is like this. Right. Do you remember something like this? We studied in uh, signals and systems. Okay, so I'm applying this now. So that means this is equal to, you see, the anyway, this is a constant, so I, it has nothing to do. This is a linear operator, nothing to do. Only this is getting convolved with this function. So P of F, convolution delta of F minus NR. So what do you expect the result? It is P of F minus NR, right? By default, that, that's what, instead of T, I have F, F. So it doesn't matter where you apply. Are you in the time domain or frequency domain? Doesn't matter. Okay. So that means, right? I can definitely write in this way. So P delta of F is that go. This is equal to, I'll still write. RB is a constant. I'll write it outside. RB summation N varying from minus infinity to plus infinity. Right? This is capital P of F minus N times R. Hope this is clear. Okay, but let's hold on to this. I'll call this as I think the equation number two, three are over. Let's write equation number four. Right. So this on the left hand side, I still have P delta of F. Right. But I know something. I, I'll, I'll hold on to this equation as of now. I'll move on to the uh, different version of this. Okay. So I'll, I'll start from P delta of T, but the P delta of T right, has a Fourier representation denoted by P delta of F, right? What is the equation to calculate the Fourier transform? Because this is a Fourier transform. What I should write here? Are you able to recall? Equation. Normal equation of any signal, any function, you can say even in terms of x of t, no problem. If I have x of t, small x of t here, how do you calculate capital X of f is my question. What is the equation you use? e to the power will come, right? I have to multiply by a complex exponential, that is e to the power, then I need to integrate, isn't it? Right, so let us do that. That's correct answer. So this is minus infinity, two plus infinity. I write the function that is p delta of t into e to the power, right? It's a negative, right? Minus j two pi into the frequency f t 
dt. Okay, so that's how I write this, right? But now you see, I'll hold on to, I'll, I'll write this equation, I'll hold on to this as well, because I want to substitute what is P delta of T. How did you get a P delta of T? P of T got multiplied by S delta of T, isn't it? Right? So, but I'll write once again, also. Also, the P delta of T is equal to the P of T into the S delta of T, right? That S delta of T can be written as, once again, P of T into, what is S delta of T? Just now we had written an equation because S delta is a Dirac boom, right? It's some variable, M varying from minus infinity to any variable you can take, okay? Doesn't matter, and other than uh, T, you can take any, right? Okay, so minus infinity to plus infinity, this is a delta function of T minus M times T B. Right, already we have written this. So once again, we use the same property over here. I try to bring the P of T inside, right? Because P of T getting shifted to MTB now. Okay, so that means I can try to write this as, it is a multiplication, right? It is not convolution. So I have to apply this, right? This means equal to M is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. This becomes equal to P of, m times tb into delta of, it's it's not convolution, so I cannot do what I did earlier, okay? I have to do this only, no other option, okay? So delta of, this is t minus m times t. All right, so this is equation number six. Left-hand side is still p delta of t. Now you see, I, can, I have a p delta of t here to which I substitute this. That means use 6 in 5. Okay, so let's do that. So, the equation number 6 in equation number 5 gives you, what is the equation number 5? Left hand side of that will be P delta of F. Okay. P delta of f is equal to, I have an integral from starting from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, that's the term. Then I need to write the P delta of t. What is P delta of t? Write a summation. Summation, m is there. And this m, the m starts from minus infinity, goes all the way till plus infinity. I have to take a product of the P of m times tb into the delta of t minus m times tb. Okay, that is done. Into, right, it's exponential, e to the power minus j 2 pi f into t dt. Okay, now, so let us try to analyze this particular equation. Anyway, I'm going to call this equation by equation number seven. This is this is where I we write we do the analysis. Now, uh, so I have to substitute something for m. All right. Let's assume that m is equal to x uh, i minus t. Okay. Now m m in the okay. I'll, I'll write something so that this becomes easy for you to. Understand? Let me write the point. So we we look at only equation seven now. So let's write something. So let the term m is equal to i minus k. Okay, right. This implies something more, right? Whenever so this means if i is equal to k, what is the value of m? M becomes equal to zero, right? Also, if I, I and K are not equal, that itself indicates that the M, what we had written, is not equal to Z. Okay, let me, let me come back, let me come back. Let me come back to this later, let's hold on. I'll, I'll write another equation also, right? I'll try to write this equation, that is P of 
i minus k times tb that is assumed. i want to calculate this but i minus k is already just now we assume that as p of i minus k is m times tb okay now we know that the p function is such a way that right the the function p pulse shaping function has to be assumed in such a way that right this should be equal to 1 when this index is equal to 0 correct right so p of 0 equal to 1 is what we assumed and that that's true always in the previous concept also if, if you remember we had used the same thing right so what i can write here this is equal to either 1 or 0 when it is going to be 1 it is 1 if m is equal to 0, it is 0 if m is not equal to 0, correct? If you remember. Right. Now what I do, I'll go back. Okay. I'll go back to my previous equation. Let, let me call this as equation number, I think, 8. Right. Let us use this in the previous equation. Okay. All right. So that means... Uh, okay, so this means equation 7 becomes P delta of F is equal to, right? So you see uh, P of MTB and I, again, I'm trying to substitute M equal to 0, right? When M equal to 0, what happens? This is integral minus infinity to plus infinity. So you see, whenever M is not equal to 0, what is this function? It is zero, right? So you see there is a summation, summation of all the m's varying from minus infinity to plus infinity. So when m is equal to minus infinity, what is the value of p of m t b? Zero, correct? For all the values of m less than zero, that means minus one, minus two, minus three, up to minus infinity, right? Its value is equal to zero. Is it okay? Are you okay? So this term is zero. Similarly, so greater than zero you consider. What is greater than zero means? It is m is equal to one, two, three, four, dot, 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 up to infinity. Again, the complete value becomes equal to zero. Correct? P of m, m, t, b is zero. Right? Are you okay from equation eight? Okay. Now you tell me what I should write. Therefore, there is no meaning for summation now. Correct? Only one value, it exists. That is equal to simply I can write therefore p of 0. Are you fine? Okay. When m is equal to 0, what happens to the delta function? It is delta t. Correct? Delta of t minus m t b, but m is 0. It is delta of t. Okay. Then write the remaining function. That is e to the power minus j 2 pi f t dt. Hope this is fine. Okay, let me know if you have any doubt. I can repeat. No doubt? Okay, let's proceed. So this means, now you tell me, how do you simplify this? Or even you can answer, because there is much easier answer. If I change the question, the answer becomes much more easier. That is, how do you simplify this whole integration in a single set? Recall something from signals and system you need to remember. So you see, everything is uh, dependent on what we studied in signals. Property of a delta function. Whenever you multiply a function with the delta of t and integrate, what is the answer? You can see, I'll give an example here. You see, whenever it, huh, yeah, 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 please answer. Please tell me. It's one. Maybe, maybe one. How do you, how did you get that? 
I, I, I need the property or maybe one is one is right. So how do you duplicate that? Why it is wrong? But it's not one always. In this case, maybe it will come one night. Okay, but in general, what is the problem? Uh, for this particular problem, how did you get one? Even that that answer I'll take. No problem. Please, please, please go ahead. You're not able to recall? Hmm. Integration, I'll write a property, correct. Integration of delta of t, yes, right? Because I have to integrate a uh, product of a function, delta of t into any function, f of t, dt, okay, is equal to uh, this has to be minus infinity, minus infinity plus infinity. It's not one always. It's something else, but in this case, when you apply the same condition, this becomes one. So. Okay, I, I I'll try to I'll try to demonstrate so that you will never forget. Okay, so let's assume that. Uh, say right so this is the time domain time axis i say i sorry try to write properly so let's say this is the delta function okay this is delta of t so where is the delta of t located at zero t equal to zero correct now i have a function like this you see this is the f of t so what is the meaning of this take a product and integrate correct so take a product, delta of t amplitude is one. The f of t has some value over here, which is valid, correct? Other than that, see here, what is the value of a delta function? Zero. What is here? This is zero. So there is no meaning for integration, right? Because it's, it's, it's valid only at one point. One into this number. What is this number? This is simply f of zero, right? So one into f of zero is nothing but your final answer in this case, it should be f of zero, right? In the function f, put t equal to zero, that's all, correct? Are you understanding? Any doubt? No, 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 uh, delta is one, okay? Delta function is one, that's right. But one into I should do something, right? What I should do, what is the value? See, all the values, whatever may be the value here, it, it, it product becomes zero, right? This into zero is zero. All the way from minus infinity till zero, not at zero. After zero also till plus infinity, you see all these numbers will become zero. You have only one answer, that is one into this number. But what is that number? That is because since delta is present at only zero, I have to multiply by the f of zero, right? 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 The f is a function. I'll put t equal to zero because delta of t is existing only at t equal to zero. Right? Hope this is clear. Let me know if you have any doubt. That's why the answer is f of zero. That's all. Right? So this is my this is the general rule. Okay. Now that means what I should do in the above answer and in the above equation to get the answer, put t equal to zero. That's all. 
right? This is equal to, you see, P of zero is a constant. I'll take it out, right? So in, I, I'm left with in, integration minus infinity to infinity, delta of t. See, this becomes your f of t now, correct? In, uh, the answer is simply f of zero. That means e to the power, delta of t is one. I will not write that. e to the power minus j two pi f into zero. That is e to the power zero, which is one, right? So that's why you told that this, this integration becomes one, right? Since p of zero is also one, so this answer is equal to one, correct? That is because p of zero is already known that this is equal to one. So the P, sorry, I'll write it properly. So this capital P delta of F, we just proved that delta T is also one. And that's why I have not written, okay? So this is actually P of zero into e to the power minus F of zero into one, because that is a delta function, okay? Delta of T is one, right? You know that. Are you okay? Yes. So we got p delta of f is equal to 1. But let us go back and see where is where we wrote the p delta of f. Somewhere we wrote an equation and we left for p delta of f. Uh, equation 4. Okay. So left hand side p delta of f, right hand side we have something. So I'll write, a, I'll copy this. Right. So that directly write this. Okay, but from four, uh, let me call this as equation number how much? I forgot, it's nine. Okay, so this is nine. So, but equation four says that this is P delta, right? So that means on the left-hand side of this equation four, I can rewrite this. Right? So that means 9 in 4 gives, left hand side is 1. 1 is equal to Rb times summation n is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity, capital P of f minus n times Rb. Okay? But you see, uh, I think I can bring it into the required format. Let's go back and check the condition. Condition says that summation of this P F minus N R B should be equal to T B. Right now, I don't have a T B over there. I have one uh, on over there. I think I can bring that, right? Make R B to the other, bring the R B to other side. Okay, so R B is nothing but actually, instead of R B, I can write one by T B. That T B goes to the other side as T B, that's all. Okay, so R B when moves to the other side, it becomes T B. So this implies, P of, of summation, summation n equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. This is P of F minus n times Rb is equal to Tb, right? Is the required condition. This is what we proved, right? And we call this itself as the Nyquist criteria. Okay, so Already we uh, have uh, sh uh, shown both of them, whatever they had asked. They asked that uh, you have to use this to prove this. Okay, I think we already have used it somewhere in the middle, saying that, okay, you can see here. This is what we, we used it. Are you okay? Do you have any doubt? Let me know. Okay, let's move forward. So we have the next topic, and I think that is I diagram. Yes, move to the I diagram. Okay, now, so, Uh, you might have used the oscilloscopes in your labs, right? So when you use the uh, 
any any sort of oscilloscope, maybe digital or normal, doesn't matter. Uh, you normally have two different channels, and you can uh, uh, you have an option that in uh, you can give inputs to both the channels x and y, and you can set it in a specific mode, which is called as a I mode. Okay, it tries to plot a specific diagram or specific waveform called as a I diagram. Okay, that is because of uh, a, specific, a special uh, type of function that is getting generated, right? Which is used to identify what is called as a ISI. In the particular communication that is happening, you received a signal and you try to give it to the oscilloscope after you put it into the I mode. Okay, both X and Y axis will be, both an X and Y channels will be uh, given inputs and you try to visualize what is there. Okay, so that particular uh, diagram is what is called as the I diagram. Okay, so how do you get an I diagram? We'll see now. What is the meaning of that? Why the oscilloscope is capable of showing the I diagram and how we will be able to identify whether there is a distortion or ISI or not. We will be able to identify that. Okay, fine. So maybe in the lab session when you do the experiments, you will see that. Okay, so they will teach you how to uh, identify the eye diagram. Uh, so there is a specific way in which you need to give the inputs, right? Specific, only in that, that mode if you give, you will be able to see the eye diagram, otherwise it will not show. Okay, right? So uh, anyway, that part I will not discuss here, how to give, what you have to give, etc. Right? Let's directly look at the eye diagram uh, in general. Okay, so let us say, uh, uh, okay, I'll write one sentence here. I diagram uh, it is a specific plot of the oscilloscope, right, which is used to study ISI, intersymbol interference, or uh, other signal degradations. Right, normally what happens, you send a binary pulse over the channel. What happens, channel will definitely make some changes to the uh, sent pulse. Okay, output of that channel will again be binary sequence only. But what you do, you apply that to the y axis of your uh, oscilloscope and horizontal axis of the uh, uh, or the x axis of your oscilloscope will be applied with what is called as a sawtooth waveform, right? The triangular waveform. Normally, this is the condition using which you can directly then then there is a button to press. Uh, uh, for eye diagram, you press that, you get an eye diagram. Now, we, what we are trying to do here is that analyzing our uh, di diagram, okay? What will be the eye diagram we are going to see? Okay, so let we let us say that we are sending uh, various uh, types of symbol. So let us say, uh, okay, let the NRZ format of binary data 101 was sent, right? So that means, let's look at this. Okay, I'm trying to send uh, one zero one. Is 
this is one, one plot zero, and say this is one. All right. So this is a binary data one, this is zero, this is one. Now, uh, what happens when you uh, receive this and when you apply this to uh, the oscillator, uh, sorry, the oscilloscope, and you visualize, you try to visualize the uh, eye diagram, all right? What is visible, right? I'll show you. A received signal is applied directly. So it simply shows, right, a perfect square, assuming, uh, or a rectangle, okay? The horizontal axis will be your uh, the time duration and vertical will be the displacement. That is the how much you apply for the amplitude. If you have a A over there, that A will be the from the, the from the horizontal, the this bottom line, this will be the A. Okay, so that, that's what is the meaning. Anyway, I, you don't have to write the values over here. Okay, and uh, this duration is important because it will definitely show you this, this displacement. This will be the TB. Okay, I'll show you the TB over here once again. So this gap is TB. Okay, all right. Again, uh, what happens is that at the center of this, actually you will get, you will uh, once again, you will get the X and Y axis over here. So somewhere at the center, you get uh, the Y axis like this maybe. And you also get an X axis shown at the center like this. Okay, this is what will be shown on the oscilloscope. Right, now I'll show you another example just to show that uh, what exactly is happening. All right, so let's say instead of uh, the rectangular waveform, let us say I'm using a sine wave, possible. Okay, you can you can even, even generate an eye diagram for the sine wave. So something like, okay, I'll try to draw as neatly as possible, please bear with me. Uh, it goes to a maximum value. So, maximum passes through this, which is a minimum. Passes through this, again, comes through. and so. Okay, now if you try to plot its eye diagram, right, once again, I, I have to make an assumption that the width, I, I don't write TB now because it's no more TB, uh, some width, okay? That width I should be able to visualize over here between this and this point. So whenever signal is moving upwards, you will see the same deflection over here. Okay, it's like this. But when the signal is below, right, you will see this. Okay, both upward and downward moments will be shown on the eye diagram. How much ever it is, it will be shown. That means we have a technical term to remember here. So this total height, what you get starting from, uh, okay, this has to move slightly downwards. I'm drawing in. So let me say this is the highest point, which is marked over here, and this is the minimum or the least point. That has been enough. So you see here, this is how it's going to. This is the maximum to minimum. So this distance is what is called as uh, the vertical displacement you observe on the eye diagram is considered as the opening of the eye. It's you see that this looks like eye for us. So that's why the name eye diagram came in the picture. So this is called as the opening of the eye. Right again. Right. Very similarly, we also can plot something like this.
Okay, so this is called, again, uh, since it was the width which we were measuring earlier, the same name is given here, the width of the eye. Okay. So, in general, whenever you try to plot an eye diagram, this is what you go, are going to get. But, in addition to this, there are, a, uh, there are many other terms which you can measure from any given eye diagram. We are going to that now. Okay, so, so far, right, uh, it, it's what something like we already know that, right? So let's not spend more time over there. Let's try to plot the eye diagram, which is, uh, which can be used for an interpretation. All right, so I'll write the next, it's under the, under the same uh, side heading of eye diagram. We are looking at next part, it is called as the interpretation. interpretation of the eye diagram. Okay, all right. Let's try to draw another structure. This is the central line, and I will draw a few more lines okay, from this point. This is line number one. Similarly, we, I need to draw two more lines. So, similar, same, same. Okay, somewhat uh, looks fine. All right, now what are the various? Uh, uh, we, we just mentioned that we can measure the distortions from uh, the eye diagram. So you can see that right. This this is the height uh, or opening of the eye, and I can also measure the horizontal distance. Right, that's the width of the eye. Now the point is that what are the various distortions you can measure, and how do you uh, go about it? Okay, so let me draw a few more lines for my reference. This is not optional. This is the red color line is just optional. Okay, fine. 
let me say I also draw something like this. Okay, All right now. So I'll change the color. So whatever is the distance that is measured between these two lines, correct? The one one line is a red line, other line is a black line. This is called as the noise margin. It's one of the uh, parameter in communication. Okay, then let us try to measure something more. Let's write few more lines over here. One between this point and this point. Let's draw this. And I'll draw another straight line over here. So, this gap is called as uh, you are able to how much ever is this width that is the distortion at the zero crossing of a signal whenever the signal crosses zero do you have distortion or that's what is the point okay again we can also measure another parameter that is between these two lines okay more this distance you can see that right this is basically referred as the distortion at the sampling instant is measured over here okay so this particular point which is the exact tip right is called as the best sampling if you want to sample the signal, you should do here, okay? Best sampling can call instant, okay? And also I have, okay, this distance, the line which I drew here. So this gap, gap between these two lines is referred as, right, the total time period. of sampling you can sample anywhere over here but ideal sampling is at the center and also you have right there is a, this straight line is there right it's a slope right the slope of this line is nothing but right the cell it's called as the timing error timing error sensitivity So what are the various distortions you can measure from an eye diagram means this is the answer. These are the various things which you can measure. So out of which few of the terms you might have, you might not have been heard so far. No problem. You hold on to that. When those terms come, you understand. Okay. But as of now, since our topic is eye diagram, so how do you obtain eye diagram and what eye diagram uh, is capable of? Uh, giving you what are the information it can provide you means this diagram and write in your own sentence the answers.